All right, I'm going to get things started and latecomers can can join at their leisure. Um, I want to welcome everyone to our chat today. I'm Emily Zilber. I'm the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships at the Wharton Meshrick Museum. I'm so excited that you're here to join us today for a talk with Mary Savig, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, first, a little housekeeping from the museum's end. We hope you'll join us for a few programs we have upcoming. April 22nd at noon is our next free spotlight talk, which will focus on Eshrick's outdoor artworks in celebration of Earth Day. Um, I hope the children in your lives will join us for a virtual program on May 1st. Uh, this is our first story time program focused on poems from the Eshrick illustrated rhymes of early jungle folk. And on May 13th, I hope you'll join us for the virtual opening reception of our 27th annual juried woodworking exhibition, Wood End. So you can find information on all of these programs, as well as recordings of past programs and this program once um, it's finished today on the museum's website. I'm so pleased to welcome Mary Savig to um, virtual WEM today. Uh, Mary is the Lloyd Herman Curator of Craft at the Renwick Gallery, the branch of the Smithsonian American Art Museum dedicated to contemporary craft and decorative arts. Mary's currently preparing for an upcoming exhibition in 2022, marking the 50th anniversary of the gallery's founding. And um, our conversation around that exhibition is where the wonderful evocative phrase, Stairways to Imagining, which titled this uh, conversation came from. Um, you know, it's also worth mentioning that the Renwick's first exhibition, Wooden Works, Furniture Objects by Five Contemporary Craftsmen, featured Eshrick, and the Eshrick Museum is also celebrating its 50th anniversary in 2022. So we have some nice links there. Um, prior to joining the Renwick in 2020, Savick was the curator of manuscripts at the Smithsonian Archives of American Art. She's curated numerous exhibitions and she has another great show <laughs> coming up in 2022 titled Subversive Skilled Sublime Fiber Art by Women. That's gonna be at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Um, she also has a great show that she worked on in 2019 titled Ephemeral and Eternal, The Archives of Lenore Tawney, which was part of the Kohler Art Center's exhibition series and catalog, Lenore Tawney, Mirror of the Universe. She holds a doctorate in American studies from the University of Maryland. So Mary and I are going to have a 25, 30 minute conversation today. I'll ask you to mute yourselves if you haven't done that already. We'll then have 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions and conversation with the group. Please feel free to put chats, uh, questions in the chat throughout. We'll try to answer them as they come or we'll save them for the end of the conversation. And certainly um, we're a nice enough size group that in, when we're in that Q&A portion, if you, if you must burst forth and unmute yourself and ask a question by voice, we'd love, we'd love to hear you. Um, so Mary, welcome to the museum. Um, I'd love to hear a little more about the path that led you to the Renwick. How did you first become interested in working with craft and design as a scholar and a curator? Um, can you give us a little bit of that, that introduction? Sure. Do you want to start the? I will share the share the images. The images. Yep. I think out of habit, I put archival images into the first slide. <laughs> <laughs> I really, um, I my training is in art history and American studies, uh, but I really came to craft through the archives of American art, and um, it gave me a really interesting perspective, I think, of American of American art and the entire field because I had this really um, broad landscape of what American art was from the entire country and then also from the 18th century on. So I really became drawn to craft and um, when my supervisor encouraged me to get my PhD, she, Liza Kerwin said, you should write it, you should write it on craft because the artists always answer their phones. <laughs> so I think that's a really helpful part of the research process is being able to have access to people who are really um, open and generous to young, research, young researchers. So here are just a few images from the archives that um, 
things like this is really what attract me to the field and just my approach in general towards towards craft, which is thinking about the artists as the primary sources themselves and um, how archives themselves tend to really resist sweeping narratives mm -hmm. and instead favor like really deep nuance and really intimate moments that I think gives a really interesting perspective to not just the artist's life, but the entire network and landscape of the field. So there's um, some 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 material studies by Dorothy Leeby's at the top to make sure that the the yarns that she ordered would fit through her um, loom, her hand loom. There's some, um, the, the orange string is from Kay Sekamachi's paper. She was a fiber artist who worked with monofilament and she always wrote to all of these different industrial companies trying to experiment with their monofilament options, including this orange, which to my knowledge, she never made anything. Um, there's, of course, a postcard, a mail art postcard from Lenore Tawney in the middle to uh, Lillian Kiesler, one of her friends. She was really well known for these beautiful, um, very visual artistic gifts to her friends that could also fit in the mailbox. And on the right is a gorgeous portrait of Toshiko Takeizu building one of her uh, closed forms. So it seems to make perfect sense that you have sort of come to the Renwick Gallery. Um, I'm curious if you can sort of share a little bit more about that context and, and maybe center that around what the mission of the Renwick was in its early years and how that's changed from its founding in 1972 until today. Okay, if you go to the next slide, I have pictures mm -hmm. of of the Renwick for everyone who hasn't been there. It's on the corner of, it's on the intersection of 18th and um, Pennsylvania Avenue, Caddy Corner basically to the White House and across the street from the executive office building. Um, it opened uh, in the late 19th century, right, right before the Civil War um, as an art gallery, the Corcoran Art Gallery. And then for a long time, when the Corcoran moved across the street into a bigger space, it was just this unutilized space. So it was transferred to the Smithsonian in the 1960s. And then it reopened um, in 1972. And I just also wanted to note that a recent historical survey done by the museum suggested that a lot of the bricks um, were, were made and probably laid by enslaved and exploited workers. Mm. Um, who built, of course, a lot of the federal buildings on, on the National Mall and in Washington, DC. So in 1972, the Renwick Gallery opened under the umbrella of the Smithsonian with a mission to feature wide ranging and impermanent exhibitions about craft, decorative arts and design. And it was really wild the first 10 years. There were a lot of international exhibitions. A lot of them were done pretty quickly in order to, um, accommodate visitors that were um, international diplomats or visiting um, um, VIPs who were staying at the Blair House, which is next door, which is currently the temporary home of our vice president. So we have pretty strict security and we have even more strict security right now. Um, so it was really designed to, the, for the, first pro, the first 10 years or so were designed to be able to accommodate visitors. So if there was, for example, somebody coming from um, an embassy, they could, they could gather some objects and put them on view. So the Renwick really was meant to show in permanent exhibitions on craft, decorative arts and designs. And the, the, the museum didn't start collecting until around 1980. And I just wanted to talk about a few of the first inaugural programs in the building. Uh, one was Design Is that I just wanted to mention because um, this on the next slide, I have two, two images. Um, this was in one of the first shows, it's called Design Is, that was in the um, 1972 program. And I just like this juxtaposition. And Lloyd Herman, who was the um, first curator and administrator of the Renwick, mentioned these two objects in his oral history interview with the Archives of American Art. And I just wanted to see them together because I hadn't seen them before. And that is the Jupiter C nose cone, which is in the collection of the Air and Space Museum next to Kei Sekimachi's Nagare. And what I love about these is um, they are both <laughs> using uh, craft and totally from coming from different directions. So the ceramic and the nose cone is meant to 
uh, diffuse heat. And then uh, Kei Sakamachi is using the space age material in her really dynamic weavings. And um, the next slide also has some just early installation views of wooden works. This was the key show of the 1972 program that was curated by Lloyd Herman. And it featured um, five artists here. I'll grab the catalog or maybe I don't have it. Um, I think I brought it upstairs. It has uh, five, five artists. Um, Warren Escherich, who the, his family, he had, he had passed away the year before, so his family helped participate in the exhibition. Wendell Castle, George Nakashima, um, uh, Arthur Espin at Carpenter. Am I getting everybody? Uh, did you mention Sam Maloof? Sam Maloof, yes. So I'll just, if you wanted to see some more of the yeah, and I and I'm I'm curious as we're looking at these images to to think about the role that Escherich's work and furniture and art and wood more broadly has sort of played in the collection and the exhibition program at the Renwick. Sort of how how has Escherich been a part of the stories you've been trying to tell? Yeah, it was really great to find a lot of these photos. I love this one because it looks like it's under a starry night sky. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's just the gallery lighting. Uh, one thing that when I was started thinking about this exhibition, which was about a year ago, um, that really caught my attention was in Lloyd Herman's interview. And this, this about, is the anniversary exhibition that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, okay, yeah. When I started thinking about my exhibition, yeah. <laughs> I um, thought about, I was reading Lloyd Herman's interview and he wrote about his desire to build this fanciful living room space, this social live or grand public living room that was going to be in the grand salon of the building. And I really liked the idea of the power of this living room space or a social space that's right in proximity to power with um, the White House down the street. Mm. And then I saw images like this. And for me, it wasn't necessarily like the grand, Victorian <laughs> looking space of the Grand Salon, but it was these really like intimate, cozy spaces created through wooden works. And, and I'll, I'll go to the next one here. Sure, and I think Escherich um, definitely is, you know, one of the cornerstones for creating these really evocative spaces. And um, particularly with, with Escherich, um, I really started reflecting on his work while working from home for more than a year. And as tension really pervaded life, uh, daily life in the United States in this really indefinite timeline of sheltering in place, I started thinking about the very meaning of home. And what I liked about um, Herman's as catalog essay is that he wrote about the special dimension of furniture that I think a lot of people identify with still. As we read it always, he, this is a quote, we read it always as an extension of our daily activity, not simply a detached pleasure for the eye. And I think this really gets at the crux, of especially what was going on in the craft world in 1972. Mm. And Escherich in particular wasn't just known for his furniture, but the interior spaces that he would create, the way he could build an entire living room experience from the ground up. So in the Wooden Works catalog, Escherich writes, if I can't make something beautiful of what I find in my backyard, I had better not make it anything. I better not make anything. So everything for him was always really thoughtful and personal, um, really drawing on the language of the wood and following the wood's lead. And for me, the texture and the feeling is so important. And I wanted to be able to create something like that for the 50th. Mm -hmm. um, and I also just wanted to ask you, like bring that question back to you is, you know, in this present moment, I just was curious to hear about when you look back on these works by Escherich and these spaces, I'm just wondering what you see as relevant and illuminating. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing having spent the last year um, essentially out of museums except the Warden Escherich Museum, right? <laughs> and so in some ways that reframes the idea of a museum or the idea of the context for these these objects, um, it's been wonderful to sort of come into the space of the studio to spend time in there. And it really is, you know, because we've been staggering staff time there, we're, we're there 
usually alone with the pieces. And I see the works here in this sort of exhibition setup and it seems a bit strange. It seems a bit like there's, there's some tension, but because there is this sort of framing, this cozy framing that, that you've identified, um, there is some sort of interesting moment of confluence with what the experience of, of, of spending time in the studio um, as one of the very few people who have spent time in the studio over the years have been. It's always, it's also just wonderful to see some of the pieces that are in the studio in this exhibition mm -hmm. to get a sense of how they speak differently in, con in different contexts, which makes me think, um, you know, a little later on, we'll be touching on these themes of stairways, which I know are a big part of your, um, uh, your thinking about the 2022 show. And, and certainly that the stairway at the Escher House is, is, is a, one of those pieces that has really traveled widely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you can, can sort of bring us a little bit more into what's coming together from this thinking, how the, the sort of celebration of the 50th anniversary is, is, is coming um, to, to fruition in your mind as you're, you're sort of planning um, for a year away from now. Yeah, <laughs> it's all I think about. So it's really great to share this with everybody. So while I was looking at a lot of the Renwick's early history, um, really at the same time as this cascade of events in 2020, I, you know, there was this contradiction of looking back and then there was this visceral reality. And again, the idea of situating the Renwick as a grand public living room felt really critical because public discourse and activism has been happening right in our neighborhood, right at the Renwick's doorstep. Go to the next, I think it's the next one. Yeah, so I mm -hmm. took, there's some pictures of uh, Black Lives Matter Plaza, which was um, painted this summer. And then uh, several weeks after that, when there was a huge fence that was put around both um, the, the entire perimeter, including the Renwick gallery was in this perimeter. A lot of people put protest signs on the fence. And this is a picture of one from I think a Washington Post article that was talking about which Smithsonian units were collecting these. And then on the left is a, a, a neon a billboard size uh, sign that we, or sculpture that we recently acquired by Alicia Eggert. That um, I think no matter what is happening at any present moment, I think this is a really compelling statement. Um, it's from the, it's a quote from Stuart Brand in his book called The Clock of the Lawn Now, and it's all about time. And that's what the second floor of the exhibition is about. Um, so in this, so I was thinking about all of these things and like the Renwick's role in Washington DC at this present moment. And then I wanted to bring the really experimental and welcoming spirit of the Renwick's origin story together to really create a really engaging experience with galleries that heighten I guess our perception with each other and the everyday. Mm. So the first floor gets, so I, this is a full, full, full museum takeover, kind <laughs> of like Wonder and the Burning Man show. So we are taking the permanent collection out and we are putting all of these, um, these exhibitions, or we're putting two exhibitions in, one on each floor. The first floor will incorporate some, some permanent collection materials or objects. And then the second floor be pretty much all of our new acquisitions from a really exciting acquisition campaign. Mm. Um, I'll talk mainly about the first floor today um, because that is really about this idea of space and that's where the staircases will, or staircase will be. And uh, before I go into it, I just wanna say I'm a huge book, book nerd. So I really wanted to bring up two key books that have framed the entire floor. The first is The Poetics of Space by Gaston Bachelard. He was a French philosopher. And the second is what's the use on the uses of use by Sarah Ahmed to help me think through the practical and poetic possibilities of the home as both an escape and a shelter for really troubling times. Mm. So maybe the next one is what starts. Yes, so our there house, there. our house is our corner of the world. It is our first universe, special art asserts. The idea of the home, not necessarily the reality, alights the imagination. The family living room in particular presents the most intimate shelter for reflection, wonder, and daydreaming. Bachelard laces his text with poems to describe the emotional abstractions of the living room. 
And while he turns to poetry, I am offering craft as the physical relation. Like poetry, craft, I think, holds the most intimate impressions and memories of its maker. So with all of this in mind, the first floor will try to measure the many amazing spaces of inhabitation from small to immense. The plan, the gallery plan, was inspired by Victor, Victor Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame, an 1831 Gothic novel about Quasimodo, the bell ringer of the Notre Dame Cathedral. Rejected from public life in Paris because of his disability and disfigurement, Quasimodo was relegated to the shadows of the cathedral. Hugo wrote, quote, with time a certain peculiar bond of intimacy had been contracted between Quasimodo and the church. Notre Dame had been to him successively as he grew up, the egg, the nest, his house, his country, and the universe. So with the Renwick as the cathedral, the exhibition will explore through its collections the experiences and feelings conjured by the journey from an egg to the universe. Each gallery builds a unique world, centering how artists have created and challenged spaces. As such, they crafted new spaces of inhabitation, new shelters for imagining, new accounts of pleasure, and new models for activism. So I'm just walking quickly through these because it sounds a little <laughs> abstract, so I'll try to ground us a little bit. The first is the egg. And when I think of eggs, I first think of Toshiko Takeezu's closed forms. She was an artist who expanded the possibilities of clay with her non-functional sculptures. For much of her career, she created iconic closed forms in varying sizes and colors. And the artist often spoke of how the forms hummed with life. She said, quote, the clay is alive and responsive to every touch and feeling. I can feel the response in my hands. I don't have to force the clay. Comparatively, many birds, like mallards, communicate with each other before they hatch. I didn't know this until recently. The young peep, the young peeps, the young birds inside the eggs peep and click to synchronize their hatching so they all can hatch at the same time. Taka Ezu often placed her finished forms together in groups outside. Um, I don't know, it's, you can still find some of these outside at certain museums and public spaces. And I think it's always really special to be come across some of her closed forms in the natural environment. And so gathered in the tall grass of her home studio or outdoors, I think her works especially recall eggs nestled in a tender nest. Then the next gallery will be about nests themselves. Of course, countless poets have attempted to put into words the magic of nests. To come upon one is to discover a secret. Birds busily build them for care and comfort just as basket artists handcraft their works to hold and protect their contents. Many basket makers, including the three here, thrive on the tension between tradition and individual creativity. So this gallery is going to be all of our highlights in, some, in basketry. Mm. And I really want visitors to truly feel nestled in the space. Next is home. I think this is the one that is just so relevant to <laughs> Escherich and also craft in general. I think it's so much about building a home. A home is our first universe. Pardon? I was going to say, and certainly home, the meaning of home has, has shifted and changed and yes. gotten new flavors and dimensions in the last year. So it feels especially, um, you know, it feels especially relevant right now. Hopefully, yeah. Um, <laughs> homes really are these physical spaces that serve basic human needs. And they're also these abstractions of memory and emotion that carry us through life. Artists like Carpenter and Nakashima, um, they made beautiful and useful furniture with organic forms and evocative drawers. Furnish furniture especially sets the scene for daydreams. Here perhaps will be the most literal presentation of a living room. And I'm including a lot of furniture in this part, especially a lot of furniture with like drawers and um, furniture that was really inspired by creating um, sites of wonder. Because mm. um, Bachelard himself writes a lot about like drawers and pockets and the excitement, kind of like discovering, discovering a nest that is also like opening a drawer in a house. And to be sure, the next slide shows that craft can also disrupt or challenge traditional uses of the home. L.J. Roberts offers an alternative to the nuclear family home and her flashy knitted map of the queer houses of Brooklyn, New York. 
Likewise, Kevin and Valerie Purrier reorient our assumptions about home to include the fragile habitats of butterflies and bison. Here they carved a kaleidoscope of butterflies onto the horn of a bison. This is a new acquisition, creating the shape of a spoon. Mm -hmm. And these spoons would have been used by uh, Lakota people um, and also to use all parts of the buffalo. They expanded represent, uh, these expanded representations prompt us all to open the doors to our homes to shelter more people and species. The next gallery I can't talk too much about because it will feature a very, <laughs> a very prominent, exciting new acquisition that uh, is still a secret. So I'll just take a moment here to highlight this powerful mask by Carolyn Crump, because the goal of this gallery about nationhood is really to examine how artistic expressions of activism, care, and community can recede our imaginations that build, I think, um, a more, um, a more empathetic nation and just nation. And this is part of, um, this is one of several COVID masks that we acquired in the last year mm -hmm. that will be all in view on the second floor. And then the final gallery will be quite cosmic. So if you feel nestled in the nest gallery, this is really meant to have a lot of, um, really to make you feel like you are in the universe, floating in the universe. And this is one of my favorite galleries because I'm a sci-fi fan. So I'm trying to like, channel Star Trek here. Uh, this gallery will feature a lot of glass because I think glass artists especially craft the language of light to characterize the night sky and beyond. Artist Thurman Statham alludes to the phenomena of space in his wall sculpture here, Arabian Seasons. Even more, he I think he captures very well the contradictions of the universe. The strokes, dots, and daubs of paint are both brilliant and intimate clear glass panels, which are a little hard to see here, um, contain, this is a three-dimensional work, contain an assemblage of found objects, including a playing card, a rock, a magnifying glass, and maps. Each object surely contains a memory of the artist, but Statham himself plays his cards, holds his cards tight. With the dreamlike shapes and inchoate objects, the word treads, the work treads on the heights of our imagination. So that's an overview of the first floor. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that you've ended on that, that, that idea of imagination, because I think that that um, phrase that, that's come up, stairways to imagining, right? This is not just something that is located in this, in this physical um, object of the stairway, but, but all of these objects present a sort of stairway to imagining as somebody will will come through the exhibition. I also, you know, think um, the phrase sites of wonder is so wonderful and I don't know a better description for the Escher studio than a site of wonder. So um, that's wonderful and resonant and I'm going to use it. <laughs> Good. Can you tell me a little bit more about um, uh, this, this stairway metaphor and how you think about imagination in relationship to the exhibition? Well, I just, when we were talking a few weeks ago, I really love, we were, we were talking about these staircases by um, Escherich and Carpenter. And, and I'll show, I'll just pull up that. Oh uh, yeah, sure. These, our, are, these are, these are great ones to start on because um, in the Poetics of Space, Bachelard writes about the verticality of a home and how this is really important. So here you can kind of imagine the feeling of coming downstairs or going upstairs. So the example um, in a more poetic sense is like, imagine yourself going down a staircase into a cellar. Everyone I think can kind of imagine what that feels like. It's like colder and more dank and maybe there are spiders. And then imagine going upstairs to um, Bachelard's example is, you know, in a tower, probably somewhere in like the French Alps, you know. And you go all the way up to the top and then you have this like beautiful vista. So these two different spaces um, from top to bottom create these very different feelings. So staircases are this really, I think poetic way of trying to you know, situate those and spark different daydreams. So I think just looking at some of these interiors that you provided of um, uh, Escherich's interiors yeah, and we're looking here, um, this will be familiar to folks who have come to the studio, that is um, on the left, the image of the studio as it exists today. 
um, with the spiral staircase that is at the center <laughs> of, of um, really at the center of the experience of visiting. And then on um, the right, the staircase shown uh, when it was originally built in 1930 and you get a sense of a totally different context, a totally different um, environment for, for this as an object. Mm -hmm. And could you talk a little bit just about when you take that staircase up, where does it go and what does it feel like? Sure. Here, and I'll, I have, I have a couple of other <laughs> images here um, that we can, we can sort of look at for the staircase. Um, this is, these are two images, one of Escherich and one of the staircase, both by the photographer um, Consuelo Canaga um, from 1940. Really wonderful images that I, I think show the sort of feeling of going up and down the staircase, right? Um, up into Escherich's bedroom, up into this sort of personal, private, intimate space. And although um, you can't see it in this image because the, the sculpture well in the studio wasn't built yet, you take the stairway down and it sort of leads you into the sculpture well into this kind of, it's subterranean, but it's filled with art. No, no, um, <laughs> it's a basement in, in not quite the way we think of as a basement, right? Although- a museum basement. <laughs> although it was, um, you know, dug, dug out as a result of, of a termite infestation. So there's some connection there. But um, when I go up and down the staircase, I think a lot about Eshrick's interest in growing forms in the way mm -hmm. that the spiral of the staircase um, reflects his interest in Rudolf Steiner in anthroposophical design, this idea that the processes of the natural world, um, they parallel each other regardless of what, um, what kind of growth you find happening. Um, and that they are connected to some kind of bigger spirit realm, right? That there's something mm -hmm. bigger and greater. And so, you know, I think about that staircase and that twist moving towards whatever is greater or more. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and then, then looking at works like these that we also have in the collection, our hedgerow stair models. So thinking about how do we test out this twist on mm -hmm. a small scale or even something from much later in Eshrick's career, the library ladder, um, sort of one of these iconic pieces that has that twist of the stairway and is sort of a stairway in miniature. And then I love that compared with um, this small plaster cast Doris from 1920, where he's drawing at um, the Steiner influenced dance camp, drawing the body as it twists upwards and across their 50 years, you can see that same interest in sort of moving up, mm -hmm. moving down. Um, you know, I, I think the staircase for, for Eshrick has been really connected to um, both how he's seen as a sort of major figure. I'm showing here these, these wonderful archival images from um, his 1958 retrospective at the Museum of Contemporary Crafts, including on the right, an image I love, which is from uh, a fashion spread in the New York Times Magazine, where the staircase becomes this, this sort of um, bolster for this very fashionable woman. <laughs> but then also, um, uh, you know, it was included, it, 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 so it left the studio for that exhibition in 1958, and then it left it before that for um, the 1939-1940 World's Fair, where it was part of the Pennsylvania Hill House, that was part of the America at Home exhibition. So even thinking about what does it mean to be a person living in this country at home, right? The parallels that you're talking about with the exhibition mm -hmm. ring really true. And if you're interested in more of that, we did a wonderful talk on the World's Fair chair. So I'll, I'll point you back to that on our website, but I will draw your attention to this wonderful clipping. And of course, the, the, the title for the section that's calling out Eshrick's contributions um, it's titled Note the Stairway. <laughs> Note the Staircase. That's so perfect. And um, what I love about it is if we were kind of looking at it from above, it would look like a Nautilus shell. It does have that very natural form to it that is that is ubiquitous in nature. And there is this idea of, you know, a shell is also a home. And a shell, for invertebrates, yeah. it, it's something that you curl into. So when we look at shells, when we look at these, when we look at these spiral staircases in a home, 
it really is carrying through this idea of curling up and like finding yourself and the idea of like feeling protected in this space and that I think the note the staircase headline is just perfect note the stairway <laughs> and they do work and honestly it would have gone to to whoever wanted to buy it right out of snatch it right out of that installation so I'm very glad they didn't so that we can have this conversation today <laughs> I mean I'm, I'm I think that brings us back to the art carpenter staircase that is going to be the central feature of, of the show and of the home section. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about this object and its place in the show. Sure, so it's really exciting because we have never exhibited it before. Um, it's never been on view at the Renwick. Um, it's 16 feet tall. Our conservators are currently looking for directions. So if anyone has directions, <laughs> let us know. <laughs> on how to install it, but it was, of course, inspired by Escher Egg Stairs. Uh, what makes this one different are the drawers. There are 11 steps that rotate around the central post, and each one has this very evocative drawer. And I also have a picture here of where, where it lived in its original home uh, by um, David Davies and Jack Whedon, who were collectors of Americana and folk art, and then donated this to the Renwick. So we're really excited to be able to hopefully we can read the figure out the instructions uh, included in the 50th anniversary. Um, what I like about the drawers that's a little bit different is that you have this idea of verticality that is about, you know, going up to a space where you might daydream. And then there's also the idea of horizontal of opening the drawers and seeing what's inside. So I just love all of these different dimensions. Um, mm. It encourages you to stop and sort of explore along the way. Yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, <laughs> certainly what I, the first thing I think of when I see this is what would, what would someone put in there? What would they squirrel away in their magical staircase? Which makes a really wonderful connection to the last image that you've chosen to share with us. I asked you to um, identify something that is on your mind at the moment in the collection, whether it's a recent acquisition or something in the anniversary exhibition. Um, and so squirrel away seems like the perfect <laughs> <laughs> segue. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we have been on this fantastic acquisition campaign. And I wanted to give a, a shout out to my colleagues, Nora Atkinson and Anya Montiel, my co-curators who um, have really helped identify and bring in some amazing works. and. I thought this particular piece of furniture or furniture like work would be perfect for this audience. It is Katie Hudnell's nutcase made in 2019. And last summer, we, Nora and I had the privilege of seeing this in person. We all met at a um, public playground in Bethesda, <laughs> Maryland. <laughs> and Katie came from her truck carrying this. This is a suitcase, right? Right here, you see it propped open on the legs that it comes with. But she, it, it closes up and the legs fold down so both are carryable. And she carried into the park, set it up on a basketball court, and opened it up. And it was really one of the best art experiences I've ever had. So we were able to acquire the nutcase. And what I like about this, as you said, is it really does return us full circle, I think, to wooden works in a lot of ways. Um, this is about ultimately like the spirit of the tree, but rather than in like the trunk of the tree, the way that a lot of artists in 1972 were thinking about it, um, Katie Hudnall is thinking about it through the acorn and also reclaimed wood. This is made out of all reclaimed wood, which is part of her uh, furniture making practice, which again, I think it shows um, a generational difference from 1972 to the present day and how we of course are rethinking um, sustainability and long-term responsibility for making things out of wood. So just a little bit of background if people are wondering what they're looking at. Um, this suitcase was created with reclaimed wood to contain her collection of 178 acorns in 2017, the artist started walking four miles every single day. At first, these walks were not intentional. She was dealing with some difficult life circumstances. And she said the walks became a way for her to find herself and get back into her mind and body and to really feel present. So as she walked, she filled her pockets with these acorns. 
And then her home started to fill with acorns and she realized she wanted a place to put them and display them in. So she created this briefcase that is inspired by the sail of a ship. And if you see, there's a little circle at the top of it that's actually a magnifying glass. So when you close it, it, there's, it, it focuses on just a single acorn that you can see when it's closed. So it really gives them a permanent home. It gives them again, this like secret space where if it's closed, you only get a glimpse of it. And then you open it up and it really is this, I think, suitcase for imagining. <laughs> and we're excited to include this in the exhibition. Yeah, I, I love this because you have, right, you have the egg, the nest, the home in one, and then because it's a suitcase, you take it into the country and the universe, right? All of your, all of your frameworks <laughs> and time. occur in the this second, object. Yeah, the second floor is really about time too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are COVID masks, which are really about the immediacy of time. And then we expand that on a different scale to think about long term. So if you think about like acorns, it's like, Katie gave me the statistics. It's like one in every 10,000 will actually reach maturity. So for her, she says, I think the idea of constant repeated tiny attempts for success with the understanding that a lot of it fails is a really powerful way to think about like slow progress mm. when we are in these really intense times where it feels like, you know, every time you check Twitter, like, you know, the Capitol's being insurrected or, <laughs> you know, like there's always something. And I feel like giving it this more long-term um, framework is also really powerful. So that's kind of what the second floor will be doing just as a preview. Well, Mary, thank you so much for, for your generosity in sharing all of these really exciting ideas um, uh, with us. I'm so excited to see the show. I want to make sure that we have some time for, for questions from the group. I'll start by taking a look in, in the chat, but if folks do want to unmute themselves and ask questions, um, we'd love to hear from you. Hi, Rob Leonard here. Hi, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm former director of the Warden Effort Museum, came on in 1990. And when I came on, uh, Bob Bascom, Eshrick's son-in-law, who was the initial director, one of the things they were most proud of was the Renwick show. They just saw that as a wonderful affirmation of Eshrick. Um, but he also told me a story, and Mary, I don't know if you can shed any insight into this or not, but he his understanding was that the Renwick had acquired an Escherich desk. And immediately Lloyd Herman said, that's going into my office. So it, it never went out onto the floor initially. <laughs> the man was wise enough to say, I, I want to live with this desk. I'm going to ask him because I've never heard, we have a desk mm -hmm. and I have not seen it, but I, I have not heard that Lloyd used it as his desk. So I'll ask him. All right. You know, it kind of would make sense because we were not a collecting unit at that time. Mm -hmm. We did buy a few things that went into the museum's main collection, um, mm -hmm. the K. Sekamachi, and also a work by Catherine, a uh, quilt by Catherine Westfall. So maybe when, but we, now it is fully um, accessioned into the museum collection and mm -hmm. no one would be allowed to sit at it. <laughs> <laughs> Although we and, certainly can't blame him for wanting to. I know that's oh, nice. yeah. he, he, was, he was a wise man. Yeah, I don't think Bob <laughs> was offended. He thought that another affirmation, you know? <laughs> oh, Sam has an interesting question here. Um, Sam Olson, uh, I hope Carpenter's stair can be displayed in a conical plaster niche as it was originally. Is that really part mm. of the architectural context? What uh, is, is that the plan? What's the challenge of the installation? Does it come apart? That might, yeah, I think it would be challenging to create to create that niche. I, we are trying to, I share, I'm working with an amazing designer, Eunice Park Kim, and she, she, you know, I sent her all of these crazy ideas, like pictures of like loon nests. And <laughs> um, <laughs> I sent her, and also just pictures of space and how do we, how do we like create space? Um, 
And for this show, I actually sent her pictures of the original installation because I do like how it has, um, you know, it, it won't have the round niche, but I do like how there are all of these really interesting uses of walls that create tighter corners. And I think, I think that might help giving it that um, sort of a feeling of being in an enclosed space, but I don't know if we'd, we'd be able to do it exactly. Well, it's a idea though. I'll certainly <laughs> send the picture to the designer. <laughs> It, it seems like a nice callback to, to Woodenworks as well, right? Mm -hmm. And all of those little niches or, or little um, sort of small room environments that were mm -hmm. developed to, to kind of frame those objects too. Mm -hmm. If I could, one more time, please. <laughs> uh, you were talking about the stairway and how stairs move vertically through a house. Uh, on one of the tours, I had a gentleman say to me as we were going up the stairs to the bedroom area, he just said, these stairs draw you forward. You just want to keep going up. You want to, mm -hmm. you want to follow this stairway. And That's so so it had a, magnet, had a magnetism to it, he felt. They, they really do. Yeah, I totally <laughs> agree. Hopefully we'll give people the opportunity to do that again soon. <laughs> People, yeah, and and you'll have a hard time keeping people from wanting to scale the 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 art carpenter steps. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, <laughs> or hide things in the drawers. Mm -hmm. That's very appealing. Don't don't let people know. <laughs> I, know I know. Yeah, and we actually have to put plexi in case you're wondering what we'll do about the acorns. We have to protect the acorns as well. Mm. I see Josh has raised his hand. Josh, I'd love to hear your question. Sure. Hi. Hi, Mary. Hi, Josh. <laughs> Mary was my office neighbor previously. I miss you. Um, I just have a, que a conceptual question. You know, there's a big difference between being alone at home and being either with one person or two other people. You know, it's a difference between one or none or a few or none. Um, so in that distinction of being at home alone or not. Have you thought about that in relation to the objects or did any of these artists live alone? I know a lot of, I, you know, in our work, we encounter a lot of artists in their homes who live alone and that's always something special. Um, and what would that mean for the viewer of these works who might be alone in the gallery or not? So loneliness and home, that's all. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um... You know, I have not been alone for a year because I have a three-year-old <laughs> who amazingly has not like come, you know, and hasn't, has not interrupted this. Um, yeah, I think what, I, what I'm trying to do for just arranging all these different spaces is to, I think everyone brings their own experience to it. So for everybody, it will be deeply personal and some people, um, might really respond to the nest because there is this idea of solitude with them or being in nature. Um, some people might respond to like the LJ Roberts artwork because it is really about community. And if you think of a queer house in Brooklyn where you know maybe a dozen people form their own family to live there, um, that's certainly gonna have a very lively dynamic which is reflected in really how colorful it is and how it looks, it resembles the um, it actually resembles bricks from a brownstone that would be in Brooklyn. So there are all of these, I think, different energies to every single, to every single artwork. I think universe, I would like people to have that feeling of floating in space where I think all you do is feel alone because you are, you know, just, you know, um, you are supposed to feel so small in this span, this infin infinite span of the universe and hopefully Whereas you might feel centered if you're thinking about an egg or a nest. The wonderful thing about the universe and the most poetic thing about the universe is that there is no center. It's just this constant expansion. So what does that feel like when you're in it? So hopefully we can convey that. So I, I think maybe depending on where you are in the exhibition, you'll feel a different way about it, mm -hmm. what you'll bring to it. So, and if you're wondering what archives look like, just look behind, look, that's what, <laughs> behind Josh. <laughs> I miss working with you too.
I have to say, I think of loneliness in the Renwick too, knowing it's been closed for such a long time. So I'm excited that it will reopen again at some point, and certainly by the time the show is slated to come off and be a home for for its visitors in a really nice, big, comprehensive way too. Yeah, I really want everyone to stay tuned. I think I don't, I can't um, estimate when the Smithsonian Museums will reopen, but when they do. Emily's show at the Renwick is currently open. It's the Renwick Invitational, which features four artists. Um, and I hope you all can see that this summer when, as soon as we're able to reopen. It's an amazing show. And it is so perfect for these times because- When will that really... be open until, Mary? I, I believe it's open through August. August. Is that correct, August. Emily? Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. We've extended it a few times during the closures. <laughs> Good. Really, really Thanks to the patience there. of the curator and the artist. <laughs> Good. I know the curator. I'm going to encourage her to keep it open. Yeah, I'll I try. know. <laughs> I think we can, we can, we can fight that. We can fight that loneliness by all coming to the Renwick together multiple yes, times, over and over and over, over and because over. it is a place that that is so rich and so. Um, critical to the work that that we do at the Asherick. And so I really want to say thank you so much, Mary, for for spending this afternoon with us. Um, if folks have additional questions, please don't hesitate to to reach out to um, to us at the museum. We'll be sending out a follow up email with links to some of the resources that Mary talked about, some of the shows that she mentioned. And we're so glad that that you could join us today and that Mary was able to be here. And I'll ask um, our, our nice little tradition in these, in these lonely times is that um, when we finish a talk like this, if you wanna unmute and wave goodbye and um, let us know you're here, we'd, we'd love to see you on the way out. And I just really want to thank Emily for being open to talking so much about stairways <laughs> and physically and metaphorically and poetically. Uh, I've been looking forward to this a long time and I learned so much about Escherich, Escherich's own stairways and his, his home building. And it was really wonderful to see some of the historical materials from the Thank you, Mary, for, for your time. And I cannot wait to show you around Escherich's house. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you all for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bravo. 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 Bravo.